Hello everyone and welcome to Strategy Gaming Dojo. Welcome to my dojo where we find, learn, and play one more turn of great strategy games. And today, do I have a treat for you? It's Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admiral's Edition, one of the great and classic war games ever made. This is a massive game and we're going to be doing a basic tutorial because even given the popularity of the game and its complexity, I find there aren't too many good tutorials out there for this one that kind of introduce you to the game, teach you how to play the game, teach you how to set up the game, or what you're even looking at when you open the screen. Now, Gary Grigsby, of course, is a legend of computer wargaming, and in 1992, he put out The Pacific War, which was a very popular game, incredibly well received. Eventually, in 2004, he put out War in the Pacific, which is the bones of this game. Uh, in 2020 speak, the Admiral's Edition we will be playing is kind of the definitive collection. It's the last official version of this game put out that kind of incorporated every thing, uh, every bug fix, patch, etc. Now, of course, back in the early 2000s, there weren't patches and DLCs like there are now. So a bunch of lovers of the game took that war in the Pacific, and in 2009, they put out this Admiral's Edition, which ironed out uh, the bugs that they had found at that time. So, as I said, this game, there are YouTubers that play this game. Uh, you can watch people play each other. You can watch people play the AI. You can learn a lot about the game that way. But as I said, I don't really think there are good basic tutorials. So we're going to go in and learn this game. This will be a labor of love for me. I get that this game is older, 2009. It has a very dedicated player base, but that player base has generally played the game for a long time. I want to bring new people into this game. I think it's uh, just an amazing game. You know, Gary Grigsby made War in the East, which a lot of people call the Beast of the East. Uh, if that's the Beast of the East, this is the Magic Mojo Dragon of the Pacific. It's two to three times bigger. You not only are dealing with a land war, which you do between the Japanese and the Chinese, uh, but you have ships and planes and planes off ships and moving troops through on transports across the Pacific. Uh, this game has a huge log logistics component to it. Um, if you missed your calling as a logistics, logistical expert or a spreadsheet expert this is the cure for you <laughs> and i i don't want to scare you off i love it and a lot of people love it if you really want to think about how all of these supplies and troops and and ships and planes moved across the pacific uh during world war ii there's just no better game uh, so let's jump in here and now look, I know there's nothing more exciting than going through preferences and options. In this game, it's actually quite important. Uh, but first of all, and so we are going to go through it here in this first episode. But first of all, I do want to show you the grand map just so you, I, I always think it's helpful to get a kind of a big picture of what we're dealing with, what we're trying to accomplish, what the game is all about. So I'm just going to select the December 8th, the full campaign. So December 8th, 1941, the Japanese have already bombed Pearl Harbor. Now you can play that portion of the Grand Campaign. The Grand Campaign will last from, in this scenario, December 8th, 1941, till until as late as March of 1946. So you can literally play the war on a day-by-day -day basis for over five years. Um, and we'll talk about that later. But I just kind of wanted to show you the map. Now you see here, and I'm running a map mod. We'll uh, talk about that later. I'll link to this map mod in the comments. But, you know, what are you looking at here? You have no idea, other than it's Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Um, so we're going to go up to the grand strategic map here because none of those smaller things are going to mean much to you. Now, here is the large strategic map. This is the entire area we're going to be playing on. Uh, we also have a key up here, like all great uh, board games. We have a key on the board. I like to think of this as the greatest board game ever made. Um, 
you know, maybe you've played the old Avalon Hill games where you play the war in the Pacific. This adds, you know, a ton more components as only the modern PC can. Now, you'll see all of these little green dots are allied bases, airfields, ports, units, things that we can control and move around. Uh, everything green here up in India, you see uh, British the British Commonwealth uh, bases and units uh, down through the Dutch East Indies here. So those will be Dutch uh, units and ships and planes. Uh, Australia, again, part of the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth. So we'll have a lot of British stuff here and also dedicated Australian troops. Uh, this, you know, you see the West Coast of America up into Alaska, Pearl Harbor. So this is what we were looking at originally. Uh, when we booted up the game, uh, you know, as you can see, we were looking at a very, very small portion of the map. Now you'll see over here in China, Japan had invaded China in the mid 1930s. This war has been going on for five or six years. Um, you know, the Japanese are pushing here in China. The Japanese almost immediately will be pushing down here into the Philippines. Uh, General MacArthur is here. Uh, hell, he's probably still trying to get troops down to the Philippines. Um, the Japanese control, you know, what became Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. They will be pushing here. They will be pushing here. Down here is Singapore. You know, they're going to be trying to take all of the Dutch East Indies. This is Borneo. They will be pushing into Borneo. They'll be pushing into these Dutch East Indies islands. And so, as you can see, there's going to be a lot going on. The basic idea here is to fight World War II better than it was fought. Um, the game is based on victory points. It's not just a paint the map game. It's not just about taking the Japanese home island uh, or home islands. Or if you're a Japanese player, it's not just about taking Pearl Harbor or the American West Coast. You will be accumulating points uh, by taking over bases. And bases are the most important thing in this game. There are over 800 of them. Um, every base is controlled by either the Allies or the Japanese. And you will be using those, and everything stems from those bases, whether it be the movement of supplies, to the docking of ships, to the landing of planes on airfields, everything revolves around the bases. And we will get into this, uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you the map to give you an idea, a grand overview of what we're going to be doing here. Now, of course, you could probably tell by the way I was talking, we will be playing the Allies as we start out. So let's get out of here and go back to options and preferences. Now, again, I know <clears throat> that that's not the most exciting thing to talk about, but in this game, there's so much going on and so many choices you can make that affect the way that you play the game that I think it's very important to kind of go through these that you at least understand them. There's sort of a stock way that most people play the game and we'll talk about that. So we're here at the main menu screen. Before we go through the options and preferences, I do want to point out just a couple of things. As you will see, we are playing version 1.8.11.26b. If you downloaded this directly from Matrix, which I think you have to, uh, this is not available on Steam, you will have version 1.8.11.26a. Uh, so what's going on here? Um, Another lover of the game has essentially made a beta patch. Uh, you know, as time went on, again, this Admiral's Edition came out in 2009. It was supported for quite some time by Matrix, but at some point, you know, they had kind of gotten the game perfected down well enough. Uh, a user created this beta patch. You can get it off of the Matrix forum. And in the comments, I will be linking to the Matrix forum. You can find out a ton of information about this game. If you find anything interesting in this game, whether it be about specific planes, about specific ports, uh, specific ground units, there is probably a thread about it on the Matrix forum. 
At the top of the Matrix forum for this game, there's a technical section. This is pinned at the top of that. And again, in the comments, I will link to it. I would heartily recommend that you download this beta version. Uh, the second thing, I did uh, talk about a map mod. I will also link to that. There are several different map mods for this game that you can play. I'm playing something called the Kamikaze mod that I really like. Uh, I think it looks good. It's a lot easier on the eyes than the stock map, or at least it is in my opinion. Uh, I know people that play the stock map. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with it, but it's, you know, a little older graphics. So I like that map. I will link to that in the comments. Again, you can find that on the Matrix forum. Uh, the third thing is, I'll point out one more time. This game came out in 2009. It sometimes struggles with modern graphics cards or modern, uh, if you're running the latest version of Windows. So you can install the game, but oftentimes it has lag issues or, you know, problems scrolling side to side, which in a game like this, you just can't, you, it's basically unplayable if you can't scroll side to side. So again, on the Matrix Forum, there's a utility called the CB utility that will help you install this game and optimize it to your machine. Whatever machine you're running, it will optimize it to that. So it's very helpful. Again, I'll link to that down in the comments. Uh, I would definitely say uh, download that if you're having any kind of install or performance issues once you uh, start the game. So here we are at the main menu. <clears throat> As you'll see, Japanese computer, allied computer. We're going to play the allies. Why? It's easier to play the allies. The old allies ultimately won the war, so they have advantages. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that play the game for a long time eventually switch to playing the Japanese. Like every other war or strategy game, playing the side that lost can be uh, more interesting because you can figure out ways they could have won. Um, but for our purposes here, for a basic tutorial, playing the allies is just easier. There's less to uh, think about. There's still a ton to think about. Don't worry about that. Uh, it's just a little easier. I will point out here, just because I play a lot of war games and this confused me at first, you actually click on the name to switch this. So if you wanted uh, to play the Japanese and the computer to play the allies, you switch on the name. I was like, hey, hey, how do you move that? Uh, yeah, there you go. Play by email. This game is made to be played against another human by email. Now, the AI is very, very good in this game, I feel, especially for the time when this game was made. It was way ahead of its time. It will give you a challenge uh, and help you learn the game. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to play another human to get anything out of this game. The AI is very good, but of course, nothing substitutes for playing another human and uh, playing this by email, you're, you're, it's very easy to find another player on the forums. Um, do find someone that's played some games and is dedicated. If someone just doesn't show up after a while, it's very frustrating if you put a ton of hours into the game. Head-to-head, -head, can't imagine anyone playing this head-to-head. -head. It's just too big of a game. If you want to have a buddy over for three or four months and he brings the beer, uh, go for it. But I can't imagine. Both computer... If you like the movie War Games, maybe you want to watch the computer slug it out. I'm sure there could be something learned from that. I prefer to play myself. And so we're going to do that. We're going to play the Allies. Let's jump into the realism options. Uh, you see a bunch of these here. Uh, they're all, you know, once you understand what they are, um, it's kind of easy to decide how you want to play the game. Fog of War, you know, I don't think there's any uh, explanation necessary there. We're going to have that on. We don't want to know what the Japanese are doing. Advanced weather effects. Now, if you turn this off, uh, you're going to basically have partly cloudy weather, which is considered nice weather all the time. We do not want that. We want there to be variable weather. We want to have that to think about. If we want to bomb something, there might be bad weather, and we can't do it. So that uh, adds some realism and historical accuracy there. Uh, allied damage control, we're going to have this on. Now, generally, I like to uh, give the AI as many advantages as I can to make for a balanced, fun game. That being said, historically, the allies were much better at controlling damage. What do I mean by that? You know, a flaming plane comes and lands on the airfield. They just had uh, the allies 
uh, had better equipment, people, more people, etc., to deal with suppressing damage, which means things will repair quicker, things can stay in service that maybe would be destroyed on the Japanese side. So we're going to leave this on. It's historically accurate. Player-defined upgrades, we're going to uh, turn this off. Now, <clears throat> as you understand the game more and you play it more, you may want to turn this on. Uh, definitely as a Japanese player, you have more paths you can kind of go down and more decisions you can make about how you want your equipment upgraded. And there's a lot that goes into that. It's beyond the scope of this tutorial. We're just going to turn it off, meaning that it's it's not player defined, meaning the computer will just give us upgrades automatically. So if you get a new plane or a new uh, version of a plane, um, it will automatically the computer will start to cycle those into your air wings or the same with ships. Uh, so we're going to let the computer do that. Historical first turn, December 7th surprise. These are kind of two that go together a little bit. Historical first turn just means we are going to um, allow, I say allow, uh, the Japanese are going to wreck the U.S. Navy at Pearl Harbor. They're going to blow up a lot of planes on the airfield. We want this to happen. If you turn this off, um, you know, as the Allied player, you already have a lot of advantages. Uh, if one of those advantages includes you still have the entire Navy that was destroyed at Pearl Harbor, the game's just not as fun. You know, let's keep this historical. Give the AI a chance. And part of that is allowing Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor to happen. December 7th surprise, we are going to have this on. Uh, this does go to, if you're playing another human... Uh, and they want to, you know, do Pearl Harbor themselves. Maybe they think they could do it better. You know, you would turn off the historical first turn, but you could leave this on because what it does is it gives the Japanese player a lot of uh, bonuses and buffs for that December 7th turn. So when they come in with their battle plan for Pearl Harbor, they will still get all of that kind of element of surprise that the Japanese did, which you know, buffs up their damage, their bombers, you know, what they hit, what they, you know, what they destroy. Um, so that's, you know, they're kind of interrelated, but that that's the explanation there. We are going to play a historical game, so we're going to have those on. Reliable United States torpedoes. Uh, the U.S. started World War II with a torpedo called the Mark 14. That torpedo was absolute crap. Uh, it would hit things and not explode. It was just known for being dud after dud. Um, so we're going to turn off reliable torpedoes. What this means is if you turn it on, your torpedoes are good at the start of the war. We don't want that. We want to keep it historical. It is frustrating as the allied player. Sometimes you'll hit a Japanese ship two or three times. And it'll say hit, but no explosion. <laughs> This led to a whole war commission and, uh, you know, in, the, in real life, this led to a whole war commission. It was a big scandal about these torpedoes. You can read more about that if that kind of, inter that kind of history interests you. Uh, realistic R&D, we're going to leave this on. Um, this kind of goes to the Japanese player a little bit. The Japanese player, once you play for a while, you can kind of, me or I say mess with, you can change your R&D and what you're putting into your research and development, come up with different engines for your planes, etc. You know, it's way beyond the scope of this tutorial. We're just going to play realistic R&D, uh, which means things will go in the path that they did historically. No unit withdrawals. We're going to turn this off, which makes it a double negative, which means there will be unit withdrawals. All this means is it keeps it historically accurate. In World War II, there were units, uh, air wings, you know, task forces of ships that moved sometimes from the Pacific to the Atlantic or were called back to the United States. Or, you know, uh, if they're Commonwealth, if they're British, they may be called back to the Mediterranean, etc. This, uh, by having this off, means that we will have to withdraw those troops. That makes the game more realistic, more balanced, also more historical. We'll go into this in a later episode. Reinforcements. We're going to keep these both fixed. We're going to get reinforcement as they did uh, in, actual, in World War II. Now, if you play another human, 
you can bury this plus or minus 15 plus or minus 60. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, if you pro if you're playing an experienced player, they're going to know exactly what reinforcements you're getting when and where. Uh, so you may want to vary that a bit. Okay, so those are the realism options. Um, let's go to the game options here. This really goes to how you see the game and how the game operates, per se. Um, combat reports, we're going to leave those on. They give you a ton of information. Uh, we will read through some combat reports, and you can see, you know, for every engagement there is between your forces and the enemy forces, they spit out this combat report. It gives you, you know, a wealth of information. You can learn a lot about the game just by re reading the combat reports. Uh, auto sub operations. Uh, we're going to have this turned off. If you have it turned on, the computer will control the subs. Uh, what fun is that, you know? Uh, I think the sub component of this game could be a game in and of itself. It's very well modeled. It's a lot of fun. Uh, there's nothing more rewarding than setting up a sub patrol and then having a convoy come over the top of it. Um, and you just, you know, start blasting uh, cargo ships out of, out of the water or even better an aircraft carrier uh it's fantastic it's a lot of fun so we're going to leave this off meaning we're going to control the subs uh tf move radius plane move radius now what's tf tf is a task force in this game uh you don't actually move individual ships now that's not entirely true you can move an individual ship but first of all you have to put it in a task force so just think of a task force as a a container that holds a group of ships that you're going to give the same order or assign the same base to the, or the same port to them. So a task force is nothing more than one to 100 ships that you're grouping together to give a common set of orders. The move radius, that just shows you how far on the map, there will be a circle that comes around the, the task force. When you click on the task force, that circle will show you how far that task force, given current orders, will move every 12 hours. That's what it is, uh, that simple. And when we open up the map, uh, we'll take a look at that. It'll become very apparent to you what you're seeing uh, after we open the map. Plane, plane move radius, same kind of idea that shows you although there will be three circles. So as I talked about ta task forces, individual ships are put into task forces and become groups of ships and that's what you give orders. Same thing with planes. Planes, you do not fly one plane out all by itself. What you do is you have air wings, which are groups of planes that have common orders. Um, so we will be dealing with these air wings and sometimes they're called air groups here. The plane move radius just shows you that air wing, given its orders, what the extended or the maximum uh, flight that it can take is, and to be okay to fly that far and then also return to base. You'll see the normal radius of that air wing. So what would be normal? Um, you know, you can push it to the limit and that's extended, then you have the normal radius of how far these planes can normally fly out and then return to base. And then you'll also have another circle that shows you, given current orders, how far you've ordered them to fly out or to search, etc. And we'll again, we'll get into that when we're on the map. But we definitely want these turned on. We want to be able to see that. The more information, the better. Uh, I can't imagine playing with them off. Uh, set all facilities to expand at start. Now, as I said, a big part of this game is logistics. Uh, you have uh, supplies, you have oil, you have fuel. We will be talking about logistics separately. You also have bases, as we discussed, um, and you have airfields and ports. So, you know, think of ships to ports, planes to airfields, ground units to bases, but then every airfield and port is attached to a base as well. These bases, airfields, and ports are the main locations for the game. This says we're going to have those all expanding at the start. So you can make your airfields bigger. You can make your ports bigger. You can make your base fortifications bigger. 
um, which we will be doing. It's, it can be very uh, beneficial. And there are a lot of places where you're going to want that to happen. But there are a lot of places where you're not going to want that to happen. Now you say, well, why not? Why wouldn't you want them to be as big as possible? Because it takes supply. So, you know, you have a limited amount of supply. You're going to be moving it around the map. If you have some base out in the middle of the desert expanding or you're making its airfield bigger, uh, what's the point of that? Uh, you know, it's not helping you in any way. And all it's doing is soaking up your supply. So we're going to have this turned off and we're going to manually turn on the things that we want to expand or get bigger. Conversely, I know people that play with this on and then they manually turn the ones off. And the reason they may do that is because you don't want to forget one and I get that, but after you play the game a little bit, you'll know the important ones to have expanding and you'll always be looking at it when you bring up a base, what's expanding, what's not. So we're gonna have this turned off. Automatic upgrades to ships and air groups. Again, this kind of dovetails with reinforcement. Uh, we're going to let the computer, you know, give us these automatic upgrades. So as, um, as you know, you get new styles of planes, whatever else, they're going to automatically up or the computer. I say they. Who's the they? The little men in the computer are going to automatically upgrade your ships and air groups. We'll have that on for this tutorial. Except air and ground replacements, we're actually going to have this turned off. This is reinforcements, and a big reason I have this turned off is we are playing the allies. The allies get absolutely overrun at the start. They're in a bad position. They weren't prepared. The Japanese are going to put it on you. I mean, as the allies early in the war, your strategy is to, to basically just try to slow them down. As part of that, you're going to have units that get, you know, just run over. So many of those units you're not going to want to reinforce. You're not going to want to bring in new aircraft or ground replacements for those units because ultimately they're a lost cause. So we are going to manually turn on the units, you know, units that aren't <laughs> likely to get destroyed the next turn. We might turn those on and we're going to decide that. And we'll go through all that as we get on the map. Uh, turn cycle, this is one. One is how long each turn lasts. So this means each turn in this game is going to last one day. Um, if you're doing the math, yes, that means each, you will be playing out each day of the war in the Pacific from December 1941 to March 1946. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of turns, right? Um, you can pick to have two day turns or three day turns. I will be honest with you, I have never, ever played that way. Uh, I cannot even imagine giving one of my task forces orders and then just letting it run for three days. You know, I want to get on the walkie-talkie and say, hey, where are you, you know, where are you going, man? Um, I Just the level of control in one day is what I'm used to. Uh, I feel like two to three days, it's a little too much autopilot for me. So I always play one-day turns. I think most play by email is one-day turns. Uh, but given the grand scope of this game, I could see, you know, maybe you want to play three-day turns to potentially get to the end of the war. AI difficulty, a lot of pl people play this historical to start with. Um, I would say even if it's your first game, if you're going to be playing the Japanese AI, so you're going to be playing the allies, have this to either hard or very hard. Why is that? Because supply is such a big part of this game, and no matter how good the AI is, and it is very good, even on historical, um, it needs a logistics buff. So setting AI difficulty to hard gives the AI a logistics buff. To, and what do I mean by that? You know, there's, the Japanese will have some far-flung bases that if you don't have this bumped up, that has the potential to run out of supply, which will starve their troops and make it easy for you to take over those, you know, kind of more distant islands. And we don't want that. Um, so giving the computer a little logistical buff, I think, uh, makes for a much better game. Now, very hard gives it that logistical buff and a combat buff. We're not going to do it for this tutorial. I think eventually you will want to do that. It makes the game more fun. 
uh, when the Japanese have even a greater advantage. And as you'll see in the, the war in China, they already have much better troops than a lot of the Allied troops, especially at the start of the war. So, you know, giving them another combat bonus almost seems unfair. But eventually, as the game wears on and you get more experienced American and British troops, you know, things even up. So you might want to give that a little buff as well. Uh, preferences, you know, these are easy, right? Map style with hexes. In my map mod that I'm running that you've seen, uh, you will only see these hexes on land. If you're running the stock map, it'll be out at sea as well. I think this map runs about 230 wide and maybe 200 uh, up and down or north and south. So, you know, having hexes helps. Um, but you can't play without hexes. Just depends. Hex side detail, I, I always have this turned off. There are a few hexes that are impassable because of coral reefs, things like that. It's such a small part of the game. You'll know where those are. I just have them turned off. The scroll delays, you're going to be getting a lot of information. This is all just personal preference, how fast things scroll um, for that information. I have always played it on one. So we're going to do that here. I may slow it down if it seems to be going a little fast. Show combat animations. I like the combat animations. I think they add something to the game. I, I just like them. Uh, I will say after you get into the game and start playing, the, playing it for a while, they will get repetitive. You'll probably turn this off. Uh, and you can do that during the game when you're playing the AI. So, you know, start with them on, see what you think. You learn some things from it, I think. And then eventually, you know, we can turn that off because they do get a little bit repetitive after you see the same thing for the, you know, hundredth time. Combat summaries will always have that up. These are those, you know, combat reports that you get of what happened, uh, how many troops you lost, what you know, what's going on, how many bombers came in at what altitude. It just gives you a ton of information. Uh, show clouds, uh, sure, why not, right? Of course, we're going to have the volume off since we're doing these as videos. Um, and let's go back. So that's really it for the preferences and options. Um, while we're here, I'm just going to mention... And we'll go into this in the second episode when we actually get into the game and start, you know, m getting past the options and preferences and messing around with the game map and the units and whatnot. But we're going to be playing the December 8th full campaign scenario. Now you may be saying, well, why don't you just play the full campaign? You know, let's play the, let's play the whole thing. Uh, once you've played this game a few times, Pearl Harbor you know what's going to happen. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you play the full campaign, you have no control. You have not done anything wrong when you start the game and zeros come out of the sky and just decimate Pearl Harbor. That's what always happens. Like there, There's nothing you can do. You cannot even uh, give orders on the first turn. Given those preferences, the December 7th surprise and historical first turn that I recommend you always play the game at, that's going to happen. So we already know that Pearl Harbor gets absolutely destroyed. Uh, we know the Arizona is going to sink, etc., etc. So I always like to start the game on December 8th and play the full campaign from there. It doesn't change anything. You know, it's just this has already happened. And we're just going to start the next day, December 7th, a day that shall live in infamy. We're going to start December 8th declaring war on the Japanese as the allies and start our march to hopefully at first slow them down and eventually start to push the Japanese army and navy back. So let's select this scenario. You can read about the scenario and let's start the game. So I'm just going to boot this up. Uh, when you play as the allied player, you always start at Pearl Harbor. Uh, you're always centered on that. That's kind of your main base. That's, you know, as it was in World War II, that's sort of your main base of operations where everything is being run out of. Uh, and as you see, those circles that we talked about, the radiuses we talked about, and we'll get into all of this in future videos. I just wanted to show you, this is where we're going to start for episode two. So thank you for joining me. I'm really excited about doing a basic tutorial for this game. I love this game. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe only 100 people will ever watch this because it's it's an older game. It's a beast of a game. Uh, but I think if you give this time and you learn 
and the, the systems are very intuitive once you understand them. Once you learn this game, I think you're going to love it like I do. And if I can just get one or two more people to play this game, it will have been worthwhile. So again, thank you for joining me. This has been Strategy Gaming Dojo. We will see you next time with Episode 2.